At 31, life was cruising along smoothly for me. Designing web was not just a job. It was my passion. I've always prided myself on being independent, rarely needing anyone to guide me through life's ups and downs. Though my parents lived miles away in another city, they were always just a phone call away. It had been years since I needed anything from them beyond their love and advice. My cozy apartment was my sanctuary, a stone's throw from the hustle of the design studio where I channeled my creativity into work that felt more like play. I was never one for the club scene or loud parties. My idea of a perfect evening was diving into the latest design trends or exploring the genius of the greats in my field. However, I did have a love for the outdoors. The quiet solitude of the park near my place was my refuge, the place where the roller coaster of my current life began. I remember the day clearly. The sun was just right, not too harsh, casting a gentle glow over the park. Lost in thought, with headphones in, I was probably pondering over some project or another when I accidentally stepped onto the bike path. Out of nowhere, a guy on a bicycle screeched to a halt right in front of me. Whoa, watch where you're going, he shouted, his voice a mix of annoyance and relief. Startled, I yanked out my headphones. Oh shoot, I'm so sorry, I wasn't looking. He was panting, catching his breath, but a smile began to form on his face. Clearly. You okay, though? Didn't mean to scare you. Yeah, I'm fine, just a bit shaken. And you? I'll live. Bikes can be replaced. People not so much, he said, now completely at ease. That's how I met Mason. He was your typical city guy. Worked at a car detailer company, always with a story to tell. He had a rugged charm about him, with a grin that could light up the darkest rooms. Despite our rocky start, we ended up chatting right there in the middle of the path. So, you always jump in front of bikes for fun, or is today a special occasion? He teased, the smirk never leaving his face. Huh, first time for everything, I guess. I'm usually more aware of my surroundings, I shot back, trying not to show how embarrassed I was. Mason, he said, extending his hand. I shook it. Nice to meet you, Mason. I'm Ava. And let me guess, you're one of those artsy types, right? You've got that creative vibe, he said. I laughed. Is it that obvious? Yeah, I'm a designer, applications mostly. Knew it, he exclaimed as if he had won a prize. I work in car detailer not as glamorous, but it pays the bills. We talked for a bit longer, sharing bits and pieces of our lives. The conversation flowed so easily, it was as if we'd known each other for years, not just minutes. When we finally said goodbye, we exchanged numbers, and I walked away with a weird feeling in my stomach excitement, maybe. After that day in the park, Mason and I started seeing each other more and more. What started as a chance encounter soon blossomed into something deeper. Casual coffees after work turned into late night dinners and then whole weekends spent together. It was all so quick, yet it felt like the most natural progression in the world. As we spent more time together, our connection only grew, hinting that this was just the beginning of something special. Casual coffees after work quickly turned into late night dinners and then entire weekends spent together. It all happened so quickly, yet it felt like the most natural progression in the world. One evening, after a particularly long day at the design studio, I came home to find Mason already in my apartment cooking dinner. The aroma of something delicious filled the small space, and for a moment, I was taken aback by how domestic and right it all felt. Hey, hey, you're home early, I said, dropping my keys on the table and heading straight for the kitchen. Just thought I'd surprise you with dinner, Mason replied without turning around. You've been working so hard lately, figured you could use a break. I wrapped my arms around him from behind, resting my head against his back. You're amazing, you know that? He chuckled, turning around to face me with a mock bow. Only the best for my girl. Now, go get changed. Dinner's almost ready. That night, as we sat eating the surprisingly delicious meal Mason had whipped up, the conversation took an unexpected turn. So, I've been thinking, Mason started, his tone more serious than usual. About? I prompted, suddenly nervous. 
Us. This everything we've got going on? He said, gesturing around the apartment. I think it's time we took the next step. My heart skipped a beat. Next step? Yeah, you know, moving in together for real this time. No more back and forth between apartments. I was silent for a moment, mulling it over. It was a big step, but then again, wasn't this what I wanted? Are you sure? I finally asked. It's a big commitment. Mason took my hand across the table, his gaze steady. I've never been more sure of anything in my life. I love you and I want to make this work for real. The sincerity in his voice melted any doubts I might have had. Okay, I said smiling. Let's do it. And just like that, we began a new chapter together. Finding a new place was surprisingly easy, and before we knew it, we were signing the lease to a bigger, brighter apartment in a neighborhood that was new to both of us. It was exciting decorating our shared space, making it ours. But with the new apartment came new realities and the honeymoon phase couldn't last forever. One evening, a few months after we'd moved in together, the first real test of our relationship came to a head. Can we talk, Ava? Mason said, his tone serious as he sat down next to me on the couch. I muted the TV, turning to face him. What's up? It's about us, our future. I've been thinking a lot about what I want our life to look like. He started, hesitating a bit before continuing. I think it's time we talked about you, maybe stepping back from work, focusing on us, our home. I felt a surge of frustration. Step back from work, Mason. You know how much my career means to me. Yes, but things change, people change. Isn't it normal to want a family, to want my wife to be more present at home? His words felt like a jolt. So, what? You want me to just drop everything my career just so I can fit into your idea of a normal family? I shot back, the hurt clear in my voice. It's not like that. It's just, that's how families work. The wife takes care of the home and the husband provides. It's normal, Mason said, his voice rising slightly. Normal for who, Mason? Because it sure doesn't sound like the life I want. We're supposed to be a team, remember? The conversation was tough, highlighting the stark differences in our expectations for the future. As we navigated these choppy waters, it became clear that finding a common path would require understanding, compromise, and perhaps a re-evaluation of what we both truly wanted from our lives together. I do. I really do. But can't you see we could have so much more if we focused on building a life together the traditional way? Mason's words hung in the air between us, a stark reminder of our differing views on what our future should look like. Mason, I love you, but I can't just give up on my dreams, my career. That's not the life I want, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. He sighed, running a hand through his hair. I just thought, you know, you'd want the same things I do. It was the first of many conversations, each one a little harder than the last. Yes, we were in love, but love wasn't always enough to bridge the gap between our very different visions for the future. One evening, as I was wrapping up a project on my laptop, Mason came home with a look that suggested he had something on his mind. He dropped his keys on the table with a clatter that seemed louder in the quiet of our apartment. So, babe, we need to talk, he began his tone more serious than I'd heard in a while. I closed my laptop, sensing this wasn't going to be a simple conversation. What's up? It's about us, about how we're living. I've been thinking maybe it's time we start thinking about the future, about kids. You know, Mason said, avoiding my eyes. Kids? Mason, you know my job is super important to me right now. We've talked about this. Why bring it up again out of nowhere? I replied, trying to keep the frustration out of my voice. Because things change, people change. Isn't it normal to want a family, to want my wife to be more present at home? His words felt like a slap. So, what? I shot back, the hurt clear in my voice. It's not like that. It's just, that's how families work. The wife takes care of the home and the husband provides. It's normal. Mason said, his voice rising slightly. Normal for who, Mason? 
because it sure doesn't sound like the life I want. We're supposed to be a team, remember? But it wasn't just Mason. His mom, Mrs. Madison, living just too conveniently close, turned our home into her personal project. Her visits became more frequent, each one leaving me feeling smaller and more incompetent in my own home. One afternoon, she came over unannounced, as had become her habit. I was in the middle of work, and the sight of her made my stomach twist. Hello, dear. I just thought I'd drop by, you know, to see how you're managing, she said, tone suggesting that she doubted I was managing at all. I took a deep breath, my frustration building. I'm managing just fine, Mrs. Madison. But thank you for checking in. As she poked around making passive-aggressive comments about the state of the apartment, I realized how much these visits affected my peace of mind. It wasn't just Mason's expectations weighing on me, but the intrusive nature of his mother's involvement too. This dynamic needed to change. Mason and I had to figure out if we could truly harmonize our aspirations and daily lives, or if our love, as profound as it was, might not be enough to sustain a shared future. The road ahead was uncertain, but one thing was clear I wasn't ready to compromise my dreams, not even for love. Her voice dripped with condescension I had not yet grown accustomed to. Managing just fine, thanks. I'm actually quite busy with work right now, I replied, striving to keep my tone polite. Oh, I see, still glued to that screen I see. And what about Mason? Shouldn't you be taking care of him, making sure he has a nice home to come back to? She began her inspection, finger-testing surfaces for dust, and sighing under her breath. Mason is a grown man. He can take care of himself. And this home is just fine, I retorted, my patience wearing thin. It's just, when I was your age, I made sure my husband and home were my top priorities. Maybe if you spent less time on that computer and more time in the kitchen, things would be different, she suggested, not so subtly. I clenched my jaw, biting back the harsh words itching to spill out. Thanks for the advice, but I think we're managing just fine. She huffed, clearly unimpressed with my response, and continued her critique tour of my home. After what felt like an eternity, she left, leaving a heavy silence in her wake. Mason's and his mother's pressure didn't let up. It was as if they'd teamed up, launching a well-coordinated assault on my independence and career. The day I made the decision to pretend to quit my job felt like surrendering, but with a plan in mind. Sitting across from Mason at our small dining table, I braced myself for the conversation. The air was thick with tension, a silent witness to the countless arguments that had preceded this moment. Mason, we need to talk about this whole job thing, I started, trying to keep my voice steady. He looked up, his expression a mix of surprise and curiosity. Oh! What about it? I've been thinking a lot about what you and your mom have been saying about family and priorities, I said. Each word measured, careful not to betray my true feelings. And? He prompted, leaning in slightly. And I've decided to quit my job to focus on us, on our home. I lied, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. For a moment, Mason just stared at me. Then his face broke into a relieved smile. Really, babe? That's great. I knew you'd come around. This is going to be so good for us. Yeah, great, I echoed, a hollow feeling settling in my chest. The plan was simple. I had talked to my boss earlier that week, explaining the situation. He was understanding and offered me the chance to work assistant, a lifeline I clung to like a boy in stormy seas. So every morning after Mason left for work, I'd open my laptop and dive into my designs. The creative work was a bomb to my troubled mind. The savings account I opened was a silent testament to my rebellion, a secret fund that grew with each paycheck. It represented my resolve to maintain my independence, to prepare for any future uncertainties. It was my way of ensuring that no matter what pressures I faced at home, I would not lose myself completely to someone else's idea of what my life should be. As the months passed, I maintained the facade while securing my independence and planning for whatever might come next. This secret work arrangement allowed me to balance my relationship and my career aspirations, albeit covertly. It was not the ideal solution, 
but for now, it kept the peace at home while I figured out how to bridge the gap between my desires and Mason's expectations. Every project I completed felt like I was leading a double life. On one side, I played the role of the dutiful wife in Mason's presence. On the other, I thrived as a successful designer whenever he was away. This balancing act continued seamlessly until one day, while I was deep in work, a sudden knock on the door jolted me back to reality. It was Mason, home early. Panicking, I slammed my laptop shut and shoved it under the couch just as he walked in. Hey, what's up? Why are you home so early? I asked, trying to sound casual. Meeting got cancelled. What's up with you? You look guilty as sin, he joked, but his eyes narrowed slightly, noticing my flustered state. Just surprised to see you is all. Wasn't expecting you back so soon, I replied, forcing a laugh. He shrugged it off, thankfully, and the moment passed. But it was a close call, too close. That night, as we lay in bed, Mason turned to me with a serious look on his face. You know, I've been thinking since you're home all day now. Maybe we could start thinking about, you know, kids. The topic again. It felt like no matter how much I did, how much I pretended, it would never be enough. Kids, Mason, we've talked about this. I'm not sure now is the right time, I started. But it's perfect timing. You're at home, we're stable. What's holding us back? He interrupted, his tone a mix of frustration and eagerness. Everything, I wanted to shout. My job, my independence, our entire relationship was hanging by a thread. But I swallowed those words, replacing them with a non-committal. We'll see, Mason. Let's just take it one step at a time. Five months into our experiment of living off Mason's salary alone, the cracks were showing wide and alarming. Our finances were a mess stretched thinner than I'd anticipated. I hadn't touched the savings I'd secretly stashed away yet, clinging to the hope that Mason would see reason. But when we sat down to discuss our financial predicament, it blew up in my face. Mason, we can't keep going like this. We're barely making ends meet. I think it's time I went back to work, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. He slammed his coffee cup down, his face clouding over. Back to this again? I told you, we're fine. You just need to cut back on spending. Cut back? I'm already stretching every penny till it screams. Cut back on what, Mason? We're already down to the basics. I haven't bought anything for myself in months. That's not the point. You need to learn to manage better. My mom raised. I cut him off, unable to listen to another comparison. Your mom's time was different, Mason. We need two incomes. I can't just sit at home and pretend everything is fine when it's not. The room filled with tense silence. I knew something had to give. It wasn't just about the money, it was about my need to feel like myself again, to return to the work that fueled my spirit and my independence. Finally, I made a decision. Mason, I love you, but I need to do this not just for our finances, but for me. I need to go back to work. It took time, but gradually, Mason began to understand. I resumed working, and slowly, our relationship started to find its balance again. With both of us contributing, not just financially but emotionally, we started to rebuild on a foundation that recognized and respected both our needs. It was a lesson in love and compromise, in understanding that sometimes, to truly care for others, you must not lose sight of yourself. As Mason's retort cut through the air like daggers, I was left fuming. His inability to see the reality of our financial struggles was baffling. Before I could argue further, his phone rang, abruptly silencing our heated exchange. He picked up, listened for a moment, then hung up with a heavy sigh. Mom's coming over tomorrow. She thinks she can give us some tips on budgeting, he said, as if that solved everything. Great. A lecture on thriftiness from the woman who still does her son's laundry. Just what I needed, I muttered under my breath. The next day, his mom, Mrs. Madison, arrived with all the subtlety of a bulldozer. Without so much as a hello, she launched into her sermon on saving and scrimping, her voice grating in my ears. 
You know, dear, when Mason was a boy, we didn't have much. But we made do. Maybe you need to reconsider your priorities, she began, her tone patronizing. I bristled. I appreciate your concern, Mrs. Madison, but I assure you I'm very careful with our expenses, I replied, waving a hand dismissively. It's all about sacrifices. Maybe less dining out, more home cooking. Every little bit helps, she continued. Dining out? We haven't seen the inside of a restaurant in months, I countered her assumptions both baseless and insulting. I'm quite capable of running our household without resorting to extreme measures. Perhaps what we actually need is additional income. Mrs. Madison shook her head, a smirk playing on her lips. My son works hard enough. It's not about earning more, it's about spending less. You'll see, with a few adjustments, you'll manage just fine. The adjustments she suggested were ludicrous. Clip coupons, she said, as if I hadn't already scoured every circular and web for discounts. Cook in bulk, as if our freezer wasn't already stocked with meals stretched to their limits. After she left, I was seething. Not only had Mason dismissed my concerns, but now I was being schooled on frugality by a woman who still thought a gallon of milk cost a dollar. After the whole budget lecture fiasco from Mrs. Madison, I was at my wit's end. I needed some real advice from someone who'd understand without judging, so I called the one person I knew would give it to me straight, my mom. I barely got two sentences out when Mason barged into the room, his face twisted in anger. He must have overheard me talking about going back to work. Who are you complaining to now? He snapped, yanking the phone from my hand so hard I nearly dropped it. Mason, give me back my phone, I demanded, my patience finally snapping. I'm talking to my mom. Not that it's any of your business. Mason paused, the phone in his hand as he processed my defiance. Slowly, he handed it back, his anger subsiding into confusion. I'm trying to figure out a solution that works for us both, not just you, I explained as I took the phone back, turning away to continue my conversation. Mom, I'm thinking of going back to work. We can't keep going like this, I said into the phone, a decision firming in my voice. Darling, you do what you need to do to be happy and secure, my mom advised gently. Don't let anyone make you feel guilty for wanting to support your family, both financially and emotionally. Empowered by her words, I knew what I had to do. It was time to make changes that aligned with my values and needs, not just the expectations imposed on me. This was about more than just budgeting, it was about respecting and supporting each other's contributions, whatever form they might take. In the heat of our argument, I was shocked by Mason's accusations. Give me back my phone, Mason. I'm talking to my mom, I demanded, trying to regain some control over the escalating situation. A wife airing dirty laundry. What next? You gonna tell her I'm a lousy husband? His words cut deep, his tone sharp and accusatory. We're discussing our options, not you. And since when is talking to my mom a crime? I shot back, my own anger rising as the tension between us spiraled out of control. The words flew like bullets, and before I knew it, Mason stormed out, slamming the door so hard the wall shook. He disappeared for hours, leaving me to stew in a mix of worry and fury. When he returned, it was late, and he reeked of booze and bitterness. The look in his eyes was something I hadn't seen before. You think you're better than me, huh? Making more money showing me up, he slurred, his words sloppy but venomous. That's not it, and you know it. We're struggling, Mason. I thought if I could work, we'd have a bit more breathing room, I tried to explain, keeping my voice even despite the tumult of emotions inside me. He laughed a harsh, mocking sound. Oh, so it's my fault now? I'm not good enough. Well, listen here, if you don't like how things are, you can just leave. I stared at him, disbelief and anger warring inside me. It's 2, 12 a.m. Mason. You're drunk, and you're not making any sense, I said calmly, trying to diffuse the tension. Leave, he shouted, stumbling towards me. With no other choice, I grabbed the essentials my phone and wallet. When I reached for my purse, he snatched it away. Where do you think you're going with that? 
That's my money in there, he accused, his words slapping me with their force. I had contributed to that money, saved from my secret work, but arguing felt pointless. I called a taxi and left, the cold night air sobering. Checking into a nearby hotel, I realized this was a turning point. There was no going back from here. The marriage I thought I had, the life I was trying to build with Mason, had crumbled away. But I had my strength, my skills, and a little bit of savings to start anew. It was a cold comfort, but it was something. Walking into the lawyer's office the next day, I felt a mix of anxiety and resolve. The weight of my decision pressed down on me, but the need for freedom propelled me forward. The lawyer, a stern-faced man with a surprisingly gentle voice, listened intently as I laid out my situation. He didn't waste any time pulling out document after document, explaining each step with patience. You're making a brave choice, he said, handing me a pen. Sign here, here, and here. We'll take care of the rest. I signed each paper with a steady hand, my heart racing. As I left the lawyer's office, a sense of solemn determination settled over me. I was ready to face whatever came next, armed with a newfound resolve to rebuild my life on my own terms, free from the shadows of the past. It was official now. I was filing for divorce. Returning to the apartment felt surreal. Mason was still passed out on the couch, oblivious to the world crumbling around him. I moved quietly and efficiently, packing my life into boxes and suitcases. Each item I picked up felt like shedding a layer of the past. As I zipped up the last suitcase, Mason groaned, his eyes blinking open. Hey, where's my beer? He mumbled, his voice rough. I couldn't help but marvel at the absurdity of the moment. Beer's the last thing you need to worry about, Mason, I said. He sat up, squinting at the bags. What's this? You leaving? Something like that, I replied, holding out the divorce papers. Consider this my final goodbye. He took the papers, a smirk spreading across his face as he scanned them. This is a joke, right? You'll come back apologizing, and I might just take you back if you promise to behave. The laugh that escaped me was bitter, laced with freedom. Apologize for what? For finally standing up for myself? No. Mason, this is it. I'm done. He tossed the papers aside, the smirk fading. You think you can just walk out? You'll be back. I shook my head, a sense of peace settling over me. I won't, and you'll see that I'm better off without you. With that, I grabbed my bags and left the apartment for the last time. The new place was small, nothing fancy, but it was mine. Located just a stone's throw from my old job, it represented a fresh start, a chance to rebuild my life on my terms. I decided to reach out to my old boss, hoping there might be a chance to dive back into work fully. Picking up the phone felt like lifting a weight off my shoulders. Hey, it's me. I was wondering if we could talk about maybe coming back to work? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. There was a pause and then, of course, we've missed your talent around here. When can you start? Really? That's great. I can start immediately. Thank you so much. The joy in my voice was palpable. Returning to work felt like coming home. My colleagues welcomed me back with open arms and slipping back into the rhythm of design and creativity was exhilarating. I was where I belonged, doing what I loved, surrounded by people who respected and valued me. One day, after a particularly successful project presentation, my phone buzzed with an unknown number. Curiosity peaked, I answered. Ava, it's me, Mason. I, uh, heard you're doing well. That's good. His voice was a jolt from the past, but I felt detached, removed from the hurt and anger. Thanks. What do you want, Mason? I, I lost my job. Things are tough. I was thinking maybe you could help me out. And, uh, maybe we could try again. The audacity of his request was staggering. After everything, he still thought he could lean on me, use me as a safety net. Mason, that part of my life is over. I'm moving forward, not backward. You should do the same, I said firmly. There was silence on the other end, and then a resigned sigh. Yeah, I guess you're right. 
Take care then. Hanging up, I felt a surge of empowerment.